Tehran's role in the Middle East. Uh, Dr. al Khali is Assistant Professor of International Politics and Director of the Iranian Studies Program at the Faculty of World Studies, University of Tehran. He received a PhD in International Relations from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies, University of Geneva, Switzerland. He has worked as a research fellow at several educational and research institutions in Iran and Europe, including the German Institute of Global and Area Studies in Hamburg, the International Center for Geopolitical Studies in Geneva, and the Institute for Political and International Studies in Tehran. Dr. Abubi has published several articles on Iran's contemporary history with a focus on foreign policy. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to be here today uh, at the Middle East Institute of the National University of Singapore. It's actually my second time here, but last time it was in different buildings. So I should also con you know, congratulate um, the Institute for its new um, Today, uh, since we also um, seem not to have much time left, um, perhaps I would just limit um, my speaking to like half an hour, 40 minutes, and then um, we can use the rest of the time for you know, questions and answers. If if there are any that I'm sure there will be some. Um, but the topic of this um, of this presentation is actually very broad. So um, I'm I thought about it that okay, about which uh, aspect of of Iran's role in the region I should talk with you, and I decided because it's also uh, an area of my own of my own interest to work mostly on foreign policy discourse rather than the foreign policy actions. Because I think foreign policy actions can change from time to time, sometimes uh, quite rapidly, with change of administrations and so on. But when, when we talk about foreign policy as a discourse, then we can uh, find lines of continuity and it's actually more interesting for long-term analysis. So I'm actually going to address this aspect of Iran's regional role with an eye over Iran's um, foreign policy discourse in this regard. Um, let's begin um, with this map. As you can see, um, I don't want to give you much introduction about, about geographical location of the country, since this is Middle East Institute, everybody is familiar with the Middle East and Iran's location in that region. Just to remind you that there is a, um, that there's a place that we call Iranian Plateau, which is a geographical um, location. And that is extended uh, actually beyond the current political boundaries of the country. It, it goes beyond the current borders. Uh, the plateau is actually confined by natural borders, not by contractual and faith borders. Uh, so these are like the sub-regions in which Iran could potentially have, have influence, as you can see from east of the Mediterranean Sea to South Asia and the South <coughs> Continent, uh, and from the Persian Gulf uh, in the south to Caucasus and Central Asia in the north. These are the areas that, that we could hypothetically uh, imagine that Iran could uh, actually have, have influence. Um, this is a satellite map of Iran. Uh, and uh, here you can actually see the extent of the plateau much better. You can see actually the, the mountains in Afghanistan, the Soleiman Mountains in Afghanistan, which is connected to to Himalayan mountains. That is actually part of the Iranian, Iranian plateau. And then you see the steppes of Central Asia in, uh, on the northeast. You see uh, uh, here, you know, when we come down towards Pakistan, then the Sand River and Punjab River would be the extent of the plateau. 
of the factor, you see the castings and the Persian Gulf, and you see um, you know, basically you know, Iraq, uh, which is also the extent of the plateau on the west. Um, this looks, I mean, uh, just you know, without any you know, prejudgment, this looks like a fortress. Right? And you, see, you just compare it to the uh, low flat lands which are around it, and it looks uh, like a fortress. So, just something about its geographical location. Something about Iran's regional law, you know, role. This is um, something that sometimes we in Iran think we are in this situation. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, um, you know, just a wrong place to be, or uh, you know, wrong place uh, to be surrounded by all enemies, in a way. Or if not enemies, not friendly states, or those whom we cannot really trust. Um, I'm going to elaborate more on this, uh, you know, question of um, feeling, you know, lonely in this region, because if you go to the Arab world, you have this concept of Arab solidarity, despite all differences between Arab states, I mean, you know, from North Africa to, you know, to the Gulf region, of course, they are not all, they are not all the same. But at the end of the day, there is this concept of Arab solidarity. If you go to Central Asia and Caucasus, um, apart from, you know, Tajikistan and Armenistan um, and Armenia, you can uh, find this, you know, Turkic link between, you know, Turkey and these states who all come from a you know, Turkey origin. Uh, and then the subcontinent, of course, there is also a racial link between Pakistan and India, and India despite all the problems. But here in Iran, we feel completely lonely. Uh, and that is something I'm going to talk about later on. Uh, there are two models. I'm talking about this course, I'd like to draw your attention to two models in Iranian foreign policy thinking. And let me just repeat, this. these are the uh, you know, models which can uh, be used to, to explain Iran's foreign policy behavior over the past uh, two centuries, perhaps. At least, we can say, since the beginning or early years of the 19th century on board, we can say that these two models I'm going to talk about, this is one model, and then another slide I will show you the next model, can be applied. Although this, you know, the second model I'm going to talk about is a little bit more recent, perhaps more applicable to the Islamic Republic, but still we can find lines of continuity with the pre-revolutionary era. These uh, sets of, uh, let's say, contradictory feelings one feeling is superiority versus inferiority. Um, and by superiority, I mean, you know, you know, sometimes Iranians feel that they have a sort of historical right to have supremacy in the region. And I have just repeated this over and over in whenever I talk about it. This supremacy is not, uh, is, has never been translated into territorial expansionism. <coughs> There is no ambition for you know, territorial expansion. When we talk about supremacy with the region, it's more cultural supremacy uh, and you know, perhaps economy, but, but mainly it's actually something about cultural, not, it's, not, it's not necessarily something about a military offensive or something. Iran has not waged war against any country, against any nation in the past three centuries. And I always ask people, if you look at the list of the countries which have been you know, waged wars in the 19th and the, and the 20th and also 21st centuries, you don't find the name of Iran on that list. Yet, we get the accusation of being a threat to the world security or an avoid. But at least history does not prove any, any evidence for that. Whereas most Western countries and some of the Eastern countries, like for example Japan, uh, have had a very bad report in that regard. Uh, anyways, uh, so superiority is like a sense of cultural superiority. And on the other side, we have the sense of inferiority. This look, I mean, the, maybe these 
terminology sounds very psychological. We don't really mean it in that way. Okay. Um, maybe instead of inferiority, we could say you know vulnerability or a sense of uh, yeah sense of uh, sense of you know, vulnerability would be better. That means Iran, when we deal with big powers, with like great powers of the world, we all we, we are afraid to be cheated, and uh, we are afraid that at the end of the, at the end of the day, what we give is more than what we get. Why do we feel so? It's based on a historical experience. As I said, since the beginning of the 19th century. Iran uh, sought to establish alliances with different Western powers, beginning with Napoleon in France, and then you know, Britain, and at some other points, Russia. But all over and over, uh, we actually we were left hopeless and alone at the end of the, at the end of at the end of the day. And uh, so we got basically nothing out of these alliances. So we have learned that, that the great powers are not really trustworthy. You can also see the reflection of this feeling in the current negotiations, I mean, these, these, these nuclear negotiations. Um, it's very hard for us to overcome this sense of mistrust, to feel that we can actually have a constructive dialogue with the West. I hope these negotiations could, could prove that we are wrong, and now we can open a new chapter. And I hope history does not repeat itself in this case. Uh, but history has actually repeated enough over the past two centuries to give us this feeling. And these are two paradoxical feelings. And I've said just in the prophecies, one would lead to a sort of internationalism involvement, and the other would lead us towards a sense of isolation and just to um, basically self-reliance in a way. Um, and the second model, which is still on this page, I just made a statement how it's, it's another page, um, it's a spirituality versus pragmatism. And this has been said by, um, by Professor Ruballah Faragan Ramazani, who is a very famous Iranian professor at Virginia University. He's somehow considered as the dean of, of, um, of, um, of Iranian diplomatic history studies. He's been there for almost half a century now. And he has uh, come up with this model to explain Iranian foreign policy under the Islamic Republic. He says that there's a mixture of spirituality and, and also pragmatism. And by pragmatism, we mean that whenever the survival of the state is in danger, um, you know, Iran is ready to compromise. Or, uh, Whatever actions are good for the survival of the state, Iran is ready to take that. Um, but at the same time, we feel that as if we have a mission to fulfill. I think very few nations in the world would feel in such a way, I mean, you know, to this extent, that they have a mission to fulfill you know, globally, to provide a model for the rest of the world. In some senses, maybe it's, it's funny, but it's very similar to the American mentality. You know, also in the U.S. foreign policy, you can see the exact same thing that the Americans feel they, they have a mission to fulfill, like to you know to spread you know democracy and freedom and so on in the world. Um, in Iran, we also have the same feeling that based on our long history and uh, and rich culture, we can actually you know provide a model for the rest of the world, at least for the countries which are somehow similar to us like developing countries, if not for the big powers. Um, and this is not just, um, why do I think this is not just about Islamic Republic? Because I think that even the Shah government and, and the governments you know, before the revolution, they also felt so. Especially the last Shah of Iran, he actually you know, claimed to have a mission you know, in the world. And he was actually quite critical of Western democracies and so on, although he was a US ally. He was never um, happy uh, to, to entirely submit to the, the, uh, the American demands. Uh, so in a way, he was uh, striving to act independently, but at the end of the day, of course, domestically, he did not, he did not enough support, and uh, you know, he lost the game to, to the revolutionary. But anyways, the feeling is still there, and that is, a sort of um, 
conflict between idealism on, on the one side and realism on the, on the other side. Um, let's uh, just see some, some more details about uh, these, these feelings that I just said. Superiority is based, as I said, to uh, uh, the myth of empire. Um, it's also something interesting that although the empire, the Persian empire, is, is dead, it's no longer there, but the myth of the empire is there, and it's very alive, and it's very strong in our mind. Um, and um, yeah, so there's a feeling that, that we can you know, potentially turn into you know, even a superpower, okay? Um, maybe it's too much expectation, given our uh, you know, economic is coming on and so on at the moment, but I think you know, the, the myth is there that, that we can do it. Um, or we are entitled to do that one. Um, and the sense of inferiority, as I said, is based on uh, this, unse this uh, you know, unsuccessful history with the, the big power since the 19th century. And the fact that we have been victims, um, you know, victim uh, to, to several uh, foreign invasions since ancient times up to now. And either the um, invasion or the threat on, of, of invasion um, is always there. This is really interesting. I don't think that that has happened for any other country. Yes, you know, some other countries have also been invaded. They have been, you know, even been colonized at some point. Okay, that's the case of China, that's the case of India, and so on and so forth. We all know that. But at least now, there is no threat of invasion against them. But Iran has been either you know, physically invaded or it's been under the threat of, of, of invasion. And the threat has never stopped. And even today, you just hear over and over, all options are on the table. You know, what does that mean? This is a phrase we hate to hear, actually, because it actually reminds us of, of this very you know, bitter history. And it once again reminds us that we cannot really trust the West. So I find it absolutely uh, um, you know, not helpful for the US president or for any Western you know, official to say this kind of you know, phrase, because this is not really helpful. Anyways, um, and about the spirituality, as I said, this you know, claim to have a mission. Uh, and what is the mission? I mean, the mission is basically to spread you know, justice, rejection of domination, and moralistic politics. Um, and for pragmatism, as I said, there is a, um, there's an extraordinary degree of flexibility. Uh, an ability to compromise whenever the survival of the state is under question. Anyways, um, well, in terms of security concerns, I don't want to get into that very much, but um, as I told you, Iran has not invaded any other country for more than three centuries, but we have been subject to invasion or subject to threat of invasion constantly, non-stop, since uh, maybe three centuries ago. Uh, and even before, since the ancient times. Um, historically, and also geographically. Geographically, I just showed you on the map. Iran feels you know, lonely in this region. This sense of loneliness is also really important. That we can hardly you know, trust our neighbors. That is, that is a problem. And let's, let's just remind that we just had an eight-year war with Iraq. Nowadays, some some people ask, you know, why Iran is really struggling to have influence in Iraq. I think it's actually quite understandable. It's very natural because we paid the, the huge cost for the war with Saddam Hussein, and at that, at the same time, we were just left alone because you know the world just needed the, you know, the Kuwait invasion to realize that Saddam was actually a bad guy, but before that, nobody knew about it, so we were just left alone for eight years. So. Anybody else in our place would do the same. We don't want to see a, a hostile government in Iraq ever again. And I think any rational state in our place would do the same thing by any means to reach that goal. Anyways, um, the US military invasion in 
in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as several U.S. military bases in Central Asia, Caucasus, Persian Gulf, and so on and so forth. I, I even have a map at the end of the slides to show you that, that Iran looks completely surrounded in, in this situation. Um, well, in terms of our neighbors, um, I just mentioned some of the reasons for this mistrust, political mistrust, you know, territorial disputes, and unfortunately, recently, we are just seeing more and more of this Sunni Shiite division, which is, to me, it's a fake uh, conflict, it's baseless, because I think neither side would, would be able to actually eliminate the other side. It would be useless to get into this war. Um, okay, um, let's see. Let's go past there a little bit. Um, okay, these are the, the trends of the Iranian foreign policy under three administrations since the time of President Rafsanjani. And I just compared them with, uh, you know, with each other to show that there was a shift, if you, if you like. You know, President Rafsanjani put the emphasis on you know, rebuild of you know, trust with the West. Um, Oh, sorry, this is, this is what President Fatemi just means, President Rafsanjani, but more or less what Fatemi did was the continuation of what you know, Rafsanjani has started. So this uh, you know, reduction of tension in the Daytona with the West has started since the time of Rafsanjani, and then Fatemi basically followed it officially as, as, as his doctrine. Um, so the focus was um, on the relations with the middle of the country. Especially because Iran at that time, because that was a time of reconstruction after the war, we needed foreign investment. And who has you know, money to come to invest? Of course, we can't really rely on developing countries as much. We should go to, this, you know, to the you know, developed countries and open up to them. So that was the reason, perhaps. And um, you know, President Ahmadinejad basically, uh, he uh, turned his back to the West and he followed this policy of turning towards the east, as we say in Farsi, Negah the Shah, which means to put the emphasis on our relations with uh, China, India, Russia, and so on and so forth, and also with some developing countries in Latin America and Africa. Um, I'm not sure if you followed his several trips, you know, for example, to Latin America, to Venezuela, to Ecuador, to, um, um, to other countries in that region. Um, and now under President Rouhani, it seems that if you take uh, uh, you know, President Fatemi's policy as, as you know, thesis and then academic job as anti-thesis, then it will be you know, synthesis, a like combination of, of, um, of, the two, you know, of the two before, to have a balanced relationship with the world. Right? And now we don't really talk about uh, East and West as much. I think all of the world is important for this administration. There is no turning towards the East or turning towards the West. But it's, um, I mean, they are now in talking about a globalized, or about a global oriented foreign policy. Um, let's go a little bit. Yeah, we need to change our lens. You know, Mr. Zarif, uh, um, actually he said, <coughs> several times that um, now that the world system has changed, so our outlook towards the world should also change. We cannot really manage our foreign policy in the way that we managed under the Cold War. Or the world is not the same as it was in the 90s. Yeah? Um, so nowadays, if the world has changed, we also need to change our glasses and, and to look at the world from a different perspective. And that's, that perspective, as he said, um, I'm just quoting it directly. No turning to east, no turning to west. We need a global oriented foreign policy. So this is a new approach. And I'm, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that this is important. This is not just, just playing with words. This shows the change of discourse. You know? Because you know, previously, based on this sense of you know, inferiority, this, this sense of vulnerability that we had against, uh, we had about the big powers, 
we were hardly able to come up with a constructive policy of involvement with all the powers because we were afraid that we are not yet ready for that. We are not yet ready to get into this great game because we have always been the victim of the great game. But, but now it seems that Iran is gaining the confidence as if after all these you know, pressures that we have undergone, uh, we have found the self-confidence to say, okay, now we are actually ready to be a positive actor. Hmm? We would like to be engaged. We don't just want to be an opposition, but now, although we have a lot of reservations against the world system, we don't really want to surrender our values and the principles. As I said, we always feel like as if we have a mission. Okay? But we we are actually thinking that now we can modify the world system through engagement and involvement, not through isolation. So if Iran before actually preferred to be like, you know, as I said, like a dissident, uh, like, like a you know, dissident country, dissident opposition in the world, now we feel like, okay, now we need to, to play a more constructive role. And, and from, you know, both sides, there are more readiness for that. It seems Iran has, has reached a level of confidence, whereas the world powers have also reached a level of being realistic, to know that, okay, 35 years have passed since the revolution and this government is there. So what can we do about it? All of our plans for regime change have, have gone to waste. And so we cannot really um, you know, predict the behavior of, of Iranian people. You know, just uh, last year there was an election and more than 70% of the population voted. And it's actually more than basically most of the democracies in the world. So that was you know, shocking to the world. That was a message that, OK, let the Iranian people decide themselves about the legitimacy of their government. If they want this government, that's, that's up to them. If they don't want, they can do it another time. But it's not their job to change the regime. And the fact is that they have not even been successful. I mean, they have tried. They've tried all the things that they could actually try. But it's been, you know, fruitless. So now they have reached this level of realism, in my opinion. Um, well, um, now I think it's a little bit beyond the region. So I don't want to get into that sort of energy uh, supply and, and also energy demand, which would justify Iran's relations with, with the East. So when we say there's, we don't follow this policy of turning towards the east, that does not mean that we have abandoned this entirely, because it's not, it's not possible. Economically speaking, we need to have relations with China and India and Japan, because and also South Korea, because they, they are um, the um, consumers of Iran's oil. And you know, economically speaking, that would be the best uh, deal you know, between these two regions. Uh, let's go to... Um, I'm sorry, because this is a big, yeah. Here you can see, as I said, how Iran is surrounded in this region by the US military. Um, and you can see that when we talk about Iran's security concerns, these are you know, serious feelings. This is not a, you know, this is not a joke. Um, and, uh, yeah. So we found neighbors. Um, actually, well, I would like to make some points as as conclusion, but perhaps we should first go through this slide and then we, you know, I can elaborate more on the points I want to conclude. Um, first of all, there is a difference in terms of you know ethno-religious background between Iran and its neighbors. As I said, this Shiite Sunni. Jackson split, and also the racial, you know, split that Iranians are not Arab, so and also we are not Turk, so we are completely distinguished, you know, culturally and racially from our surroundings. Uh, so it's a little bit hard to um, make you know convergence. Although I really believe it's impossible because I think the experience of European Union and the experience of ASEAN, for example, in this region, can show that it's possible because. 
For example, in, in Europe, let's remember that 60 years ago they had the Second World War, and the level of hatred, the level of destruction uh, was not comparable to anything we have now in the Middle East. Okay? So if they managed, if, if, if the Europeans managed to overcome the linguistic, the racial you know, differences in order to have this union today after only 60 years from the Second World War, I'm sure we can also do, you know, do the same thing in the Middle East. I don't really believe that these elements are um, or should actually prevent Iran and its neighbors to, to become closer. Um, divergence views on oil. This oil is really an important issue. I just get back to it in my concluding remarks. This is very important. In, uh, I think this is a big prevention, a big factor of in prevention of convergence in the region. Okay? Because we look like separate islands. We just have oils. I mean, these are you know oil rich countries in that region like Saudi Arabia, you know UAE, Bahrain, Qatar, you know, Iran, Iraq, and um, we are in that sense we are competing with each other in the market. So there's no interdependence, there's no economic interdependence, and this whenever you don't have economic interdependence, then it's very hard to talk about regional convergence. Um, you should add to this unresolved territorial disputes with UAE and Iraq. We are still having some arguments over territorial issues. Um, you know, it's quite interesting for you to know that, that even with, with Iraq, we still don't have full peace. In, I mean, in legal terms, uh, we are not in peace. It, it's just a ceasefire. It means that, that the terms of the UN Security Council Resolution 598 are not yet uh, fully implemented. Um, and number four is important. Again, I will get them, come back to it later. Reaction to outside influence in the region. So external factors, external powers are very important. There. And the role in this region are, um, is really important in, um, in preventing more convergence. And that is somehow related to oil, somehow you know, related to the existence of, for example, Israel in that region, and to some other elements. So you see that the big powers, the external powers, have, have clear interests in the region to, to protect. So even if they need to split the countries in the region, they would do it. They would not you know, think twice about it because the first priority for them is, is their own interest. Um, and number five is, of course, in the, uh, in the reception and also reaction to the Islamic Revolution uh, in Iran, in the Arab world. As you know, most of the Arab countries uh, showed a negative reaction to the Islamic Revolution because they thought that it's actually a sort of threat against their own uh, you know, survival. To me, it's actually somewhat similar to what happened after the, after the French Revolution in Europe. Going back to the early years of the 19th century, uh, as you know, when the you know, French Revolution happened, and then even the Napoleonic Wars, uh, most of European powers, then all of them were actually monarchies, they came together you know, in the Congress of Vienna to, to, you know, to reach an arrangement in order to prevent any more threats or any more you know, revolution against the existing monarchies. So I think, for example, the GCC, today the, you know, the Gold Cooperation Council, is shaped exactly in the same framework as the Congress of Vienna. Let's, let's, let's ally against this you know, threat of revolution. And this is really, really uh, dangerous because we um, say in international relations, we can have two systems. One system is actually a sort of alliance system. In alliance system, you always have a threat. You should always have an external threat against which you would ally with each other. Um, but there's another system which we call collective system. And collective system is not based on threat. For example, ASEAN is a collective system. It's not based on any... on um, and responding to any external threat. Okay, so that gives a lot of room for you know, regional cooperation. 
But when it's just about like counterbalancing each other, because I consider you as a threat and you consider me as a threat, then there's less hope for any um, you know convergence at the end of the day. So actually, for example, GCC itself is actually quite problematic. So if we want to have a sort of eventual convergence in the region, I think the Arabs, uh, you know, the Arab states and the Gulf, they should uh, seriously reconsider uh, what, what they have today. And they decide the fact that uh, they have a lot of differences among themselves as well. So they don't even follow the same policy. Oman today is more friendly to Iran, you know, Kuwait is more friendly uh, than Saudi Arabia. So it's not even a sort of complete aligned system. Anyways, um, uh, yeah, these are the territorial issues in the, the three islands, in the three tiny islands in the Strait of Hormuz, between Iran and the state of uh, Sharjah in UAE, and the case of uh, the uh, Shat al Arab between Iran and Iraq. Uh, that is one thing. Okay, so I think we stop here, and I'll just make some some conclusions. Um, my conclusion is that if we want to have a sort of uh, you know regional convergence in the region, eventually, uh, we should uh, um, consider three levels of analysis. One level is domestic level. I think in order to have a regional you know unity or regional union eventually, that's not uh, you know, too much to expect. Um, first of all, we need a change in the domestic structure of the countries. I think without democracy, it's impossible to reach a sort of regional unity, as, as it was the case in the European Union, for example, or to a large, to a large extent in the Ossan area. It, it also happened. Domestically, we need change, we need reform in, this, in all the countries of the region. I think Iran and also Turkey are the most progressive ones, but, but most of the Arab states are completely behind uh, this, this move towards democracy. Despite Arab Spring, you see, I mean, to me from the beginning, it was actually, I was, I was very pessimistic about the outcomes because democracy cannot really be achieved overnight. So the spring is over now, and now we are just getting to the autumn, you know, as, as, as you can see in Egypt. Um, and, um, and in Saudi Arabia, it's, you know, it's still winter. So, uh, you know, it's completely hopeless. Um, and I think it's very important. So domestic structure and, and moving toward democracy is the first level of analysis. The second level is among the countries of the region, like the regional level, we come one one floor up. And I think we need economic interdependence in the region. That is a very important condition. As long as Iran, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, UAE, Iraq, they are all like separate islands, they're just you know, selling their own oil, and they, you know, they don't care about each other, and actually they're competing with each other in, in the oil market. If Iran is under sanctions, Saudi Arabia says, okay, no worries, we can provide up to 10 million barrels per day, just, you know, just to replace Iran. So that shows that there is no interdependence. I mean, Saudi Arabia is even um, interested in uh, somehow removal of Iran from the oil market because it's, you know, it's good for it. And that's not something you would need for a sort of regional unity. Uh, so economic interdependence means that we should uh, you know, eventually, hopefully, we should reduce our uh, you know, reliance on oil, at least at the regional level. Maybe oil would would remain as a strategic you know crop in the region, and uh, you know, there's no doubt in that for another century. But at least we can you know develop some sort of you know inter-regional economic cooperation uh, that would you know reduce the tensions, that would reduce the possibilities of war, and so on and so forth. Um, and the third level of analysis concerns the international system. That, that we go to the last floor, which is the international system. And in that level, I think the role of external powers is very important. Um, so, you know, for the moment, unfortunately, we are victims of, 
uh, of a lot of interventions. And um, you know, talking about continuity, let me remind you that you know there is a quote from the Shah of Iran, and that's not about Islamic Republic. That's the Shah, who said, and, you know, he said this under the Cold War, which is really impressive to me. He said, "We want the Persian. We consider the Persian Gulf as a closed sea, and we don't want to see any external troops in this region. Um, not the Americans nor the Russians." So this is important. I mean, even the Shah, who was considered as a US ally, he said, we don't want to see Americans in the Persian Gulf, as we don't want to see any other power in the Persian Gulf. But go to the Arab countries and ask them, they would love to see Americans around. Okay, so there is this kind of you know, difference of you know, views over you know, the presence of external powers is actually problematic. And I think in all you know, regions where we have experienced the regional convergence of European Union, like ASEAN, and so on, and so forth, there was a sort of agreement about how to regulate relations with external powers, how to confine the extent of intervention by external powers in the regional affairs. And unfortunately, it seems that there is no consensus in the region, in our part of the world, about it. But I'm just saying that if you know one day you want to move towards regional convergence, that's that's a very important precondition to come up with the same uh, you know position about the role of, of the foreign powers in this region. Um, okay, to conclude, I think um, just let me go back to what I said before that there is a change of discourse happening today in Iran. They're moving away from the typical discourse I explained to you. They're moving away from this model of superiority and inferiority. They're gaining more confidence in terms of you know, playing in the great game or talking to the world powers. At the same time, I know that this administration is really determined to get away from the idea of supremacy and hegemony in the region. We don't really want to be, to be the hegemon of the region. We don't want to be the gendarme of the region. If anyone wants to, you know, re, uh, um, recreate the model of the Shah, who was the gendarme of the region, and think that you know that was a fortunate time, I don't think so. I think at that time, you, you know, well, you know, first of all, it was the Cold War, and then the Arab states were not as strong as today, and so on and so forth. So if the Shah became the gendarme of the region, that was no surprise. But now we can't really claim the same position. It's really um, unhelpful. And um, so I think it's actually a change of discourse in this sense now that, that we don't really want to become the hegemon in a big region. We don't want to be a strong country in the big region. We want the whole region to be a strong. And we are you know, just as a member of that. So this change of tendency, this change of view towards the region is really important, which is fortunately happening, I can tell you. It's happening now, but um, that's not just up to us. Okay, we are just doing our best to change our our views, but also the others in the region, as I said, they also need to change their glasses and to look at Iran from a different perspective. Not to look at Iran as a threat, because that's not helpful. As I said, to change, you know, to have a shift between alliance system and collective system, there's a big. Uh, we need a big move. Uh, so thank you so much. I think the you know, time is over for me. And the floor you know, can be open to questions and answers. Thank you. So please um, offer any questions or comments for Dr. Abu. And please don't bombard me with questions because I need some. Some seconds to rest. <laughs> I, I'm not going to bombard you, but I, I want, I, I'd like to know what your, your thoughts are on the direction of Iran's relationship with Russia, and particularly in light of sort of increasing nationalism and almost, or, and not almost, but religious nationalism that we see in Russia, which is almost falling into the old 19th century pattern. Okay, I think. Um, Let's stick to the you know, framework of, of the region, because you know, Russia has a very story. I had a slide about Russia, actually. I just jumped over it. I had a slide about China and, and also the US. But we are not talking about the great powers. I, I thought you know, this session would be about the Middle East. So 
let's just receive other questions about the Middle East and then I will be happy to answer this question again. Hi, my name is from the Department of Political Science here, uh, here to have you here. Uh, well, uh, thanks for the presentation, however, but I guess it's very unfair if we blame all the actors in the region and what the mess that we have, things that we have. Uh, the mess that we have in the region actually started to fight with the revolution when it started they came with the idea of exporting revolution to the Arab nations. We are still remembering the way that uh, I do mean, how humiliating the way in the region, humiliating the way the the heads of the states in the Arab, Arab, Arab region. And also we opened the first office of supporting the so-called freedom movements in the uh, Middle East countries. And it was actually uh, came up to the existence of or establishment of Hezbollah in Lebanon or Jihad Islam in Palestinian territory and so many other of these uh, groups all around the world. So I guess uh, as much as other countries, especially Arab countries of the region, need to cooperate with Iran, Iran also should start cooperating with the uh, neighboring countries as well. That is one thing. Secondly, um, just a point. Um, we were talking about the shift of foreign policy when it comes to the administration. However, I was wondering um, what would be the role of the Supreme Leader of Iran in that? Because he is actually the one uh, telling, you know, like actually making the uh, main uh, objectives or main directions of the foreign policy of Iran. And uh, he has been in power for 25 years for the time being. And uh, he has been, when all these administrations were happening in Iran, and he was still in charge. So I was wondering if you can address his role as well. And uh, yeah, for the time being, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I don't. Yeah, here we don't really want to say who actually began first. I mean, no, I mean, I, everybody I, I, can. I think the from that you are actually blaming everybody. No, no, no. Actually, the whole point was about Iran, that we have started to change our, our mentality. Okay, so we have already started that. Um, this would hint that. Uh, Maybe before we had a different mentality, um, but of course, a, a you know it's quite natural when when a revolution happens, when we have that a sort of radicalism um, emerge. Uh, that's um, that happens everywhere where when we have a revolution. Um, but I'm just saying that Iran has also its its own reasons because. Um, yeah, the export of revolution sounded quite, you know, threatening. But at the end of the, you know, at the end of the day, who attacked who? You know, at the end of the day, you know, it was Saddam Hussein who attacked Iran, and then the whole, do you even doubt about it? So that's no, no, that's something you can go on research. Huh? Um, I'm sorry. I'm well, then, then we can also think about the reasons Saddam attacked Kuwait. Why not? Oh, you know, um, and I think, you know, all Iraqis. If you ask all Iraqis, even those who were in the opposition, they would support Saddam in that sense because they thought Kuwait is the 19th uh, in the province of Iraq. But, but this is wrong. I mean, uh, anyways, Beijing war at that, you know, at that level, uh, just because of some some pretexts, uh, you know, pretext texts uh, um, is not really acceptable. But as I said, we don't really want now to look back and say uh, whose false was it. I mean, who did what first? This is this is really like an endless, you know, endless debate because you know we can always continue just blaming each other to say that oh it was your fault, it was my fault, and so on and so forth. And we get nowhere like that. I think what we need now is just to look forward. Um, for the moment, there are some. Members of the GCC, as I said, like Oman or Kuwait, for example, uh, and even UAE itself. I think UAE, it, it, you know, it's, it's not really, uh, you know, in that sense, it's not really unified. For example, the people of Dubai uh, would be really interested to have, you know, better, you know, better relations with Iran. And I think the Sheikh of Dubai, you know, Sheikh Sheikh Mohammed, was was the first one who reacted positively to the negotiations, to the possibility of removal of sanctions. Um, there's a problem with Abu Zabi and Sharjah, uh, you know, for political reasons. But uh, but overall, I think now it's you know since the time of Khatami, we have made a lot of progress in terms of you know, trust building. And 
at least today, there's no threat. I mean, there's no, um, there's no more threats from Iran against these countries. There is no more call for a sort of revolution or change of government in, in these countries. At the moment, Iran does not really want to change any regime in the region. I mean, that's actually the thing we get uh, accused for, because we support you know, the Syrian government or the Iraqi government, the established governments. And it's like somehow we are you know, pro-status quo. I think the game has changed in a way that, that you know, we have become pro-status quo and Saudi Arabia has become radical. And suddenly radicalism has become a good thing. Um, whereas you know, 30 years ago, if anyone you know, tried to, to overthrow a government, the established government, it would be accused of um, being radical. Anyways, um, now I think Iran is really you know, sticking to this you know, position of supporting the status quo for any reason. So for the moment, I think we have done our share. Even if in the past there were complex cities, we can just leave it to the historians to talk about it. But um, now we can say that this you know, kind of threatening rhetoric from the Iranian side has stopped. Uh, but from the other side, you know, you know, the other side is not responding, really. Um, but yeah, so I don't really want to say that Iran uh, should not be blamed for anything. Uh, of course, when you have a dispute, there are two sides, and and, and both sides uh, could be blamed, you know, perhaps, for, for the wrong things they have done. Um, you know, the role of the Supreme Leader is actually a very good question. This is, of course, important. Um, let me tell you, in, in, you know, the Middle East, I don't know if you have been to the Middle East or how much you know the Middle East, but it's a very... Um, vibrant region, I mean, it's a region in constant turmoil and constant conflict and crisis. Um, so if someone is actually leading a very important country in that region for 25 years, and that country today is the most stable country in that region, it means that he's not really, uh, you know, he's not so stupid, okay? He knows what he's doing. So um, I think it's important, I mean, whether we like him or not, we should respect uh, you know, the role he has played in the region. Um, because at the end of the day, you look at the outcome. You know, the outcome is not so bad. I mean, you're the whole region. No, it's the outcome for Iran in the region and in the world. I mean, yes. I mean, Just yes, the international you mean, the region, yes. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yes. yes. We, I mean, we're talking about foreign policy now. Um, so that's just one thing that you know we uh, should maybe take his role more seriously. Um, but the point is that you know today there is a consensus. This this I said in in a closed uh, session in um, in the Hague with the representatives of the U.S. Embassy, French Embassy, and also British Embassy right there. That was about the nuclear talks, and I said um, the message I have. I brought for you from Tehran is that there is a consensus in Tehran about the nuclear talks today. There's a consensus about change of policy. This is not just a tactic. That's that's another evidence that you know this is just a change of a strategy. This is a change of outlook. Because it's the first time that there's consensus among all major pillars of the government, from the Supreme Leader to the President to the Parliament to the National Security Council. You know, even the revolutionary guards. I think all these you know, pillars are actually unanimously supporting um, these negotiations now. Uh, so you see that something which was a taboo for 35 years, talking about um, you know Iran-U.S. negotiations, was a taboo. But suddenly now we are talking to the U.S. Uh, you know very intimately, and you know, so that happened in less than six months. But that's. Um, that's far from being a tactic because this is, you know, this is more than a tactic. You know, it's like as if you are changing what you have said for 35 years. So it's not easy. It's not, it's, you know, it's not at the level of a tactic for me. Um, and I think he's supporting this change of policy now for any reason. Um, probably because of of what I said. You know, what is most important uh, for the leader? And I, 
I'm sorry I don't have the references here with me because I was not really ready uh, to talk about this specific case. But I could give you the I could give you the um, actually references to his speeches there. That he um, you know since some some years ago he has talked about Iran US relations. And he said that um, he's not fundamentally opposed to the relations, but he would approve it under certain conditions. And if the conditions are actually provided, there is no problem. Um, it seems to me that we were not really ready for these kind of negotiations 10 years ago. Yes, we paid a, a huge cost uh, under the sanctions. Our economy was actually weakened. Um, you know, the economic stamina of the country was really damaged. You know, the level of production uh, and so on really decreased. But at the end of the day, I think 10 years ago, we were not really ready for the shift of a strategy. If we talk to the US 10 years ago, it would be just a short term talk or just to resolve a minor issue in, you know, in Afghanistan or in Iraq or here and there. But now we are actually ready for a bigger game which is, I think, you know, the product of these 10 years of suffering and you know, sanctions, because it gave us this confidence that, that yes, we are able to resist the pressure, at the same time the US has also realized that it's useless to continue on that line. So now I think there is a more um, mutual understanding from both sides to get over this stage. You may not agree with me, but that's fine. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you for the great lecture, which made me miss home. Um, I, I had a question, because I'm doing my thesis on uh, discourse analysis, constructivist discourse analysis, and you talked about a shift in discourse. Uh, you already answered me to some extent um, when you were answering the gentleman. But I wanted to see that, is this shift only in the discourse of the Iranian foreign policy, or has the constructed identity of Iran um, started to change as well? Can you say that that shift also exists in the constructed uh, identity, and how Iran sees itself, and how Iran sees the outer world? And yeah. also, uh, there's another question which is kind of related. Uh, it's about how uh, the rest of the world sees Iran. Do you think that that has also changed, and uh, are we viewed differently in the world right now? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, um, I think both your questions would have uh, the same answer, that we need time for both of them. I mean, a change of discourse until, you know, even a change of discourse, what I'm talking about, I mean, it's actually too, too early to um, actually claim that it's happened. Okay, so this is my, my own claim, maybe some, some other people would say that it's not even happening. But for some reasons, I think that it's happening, and it, you know, it needs time for us in order to see the complete you know, discourse you know, coming out of it. And um, until it would be you know, translated into action, maybe we need uh, another uh, you know, few years. Uh, because it also depends on the response that we receive at every stage from the other side. So if, if for example, you know, these negotiations uh, would end up without any results, then it would be harder for this new discourse to develop. But if the negotiations uh, you know, end, you know, end up actually forcefully, then I'm, I'm sure that the ground would be actually more prepared for, you know, for, you know, for the discourse to grow and also for it to be to be translated into actions. Um, so this, this negotiation to me is really important. This is like a pretest. It's not just a simple negotiation that, that happens every day in the world. It's actually a test for the triumph or failure of diplomacy in the 21st century. To me, it's not just Iran which could benefit from the negotiations. It's all the big powers. It's actually the first time that you see all big powers you know, come to talk to a single state in this way. This, this does not really happen every day. So if this actually fails, this is also a failure of the recovery. It's not only the failure of Iran. And I think that's not really been good for the reputation of diplomacy in, in the 21st century. So if 
this would lead us to a better uh, you know, situation. And I'm very hopeful that, uh, that this discourse uh, you know, could actually grow faster. Um, and the image is also very, you know, a very important question. I think one of the reasons that, uh, that both the Supreme Leader and the President today uh, having reached this consensus uh, to change the policy is, is actually exactly because of the image. Because maybe, uh, you know, economically speaking, maybe we could still continue for another two or three years under tighter sanctions. If, if you imagine that the purpose of sanctions is to just make countries so desperate to accept to come to the negotiation table, that was not really the moment for Iran. Okay? That was not the moment. And, and let's just remember that, that the initiative for negotiations, for these new round of negotiations, came from Iran. So, to me, there was actually a more important reason than just economy. And that was the image. Okay, that, that the Iranian government realized that, that its image in the world is misrepresented. We don't really want to destabilize anybody or you know, any part of the world, but we are seeing like that. We're seeing like a major threat. Whether it's wrong or right, I think uh, you know, it was Yushka Fischer who said that you know, perception is even more important than facts because perceptions can still uh, lead us to you know, certain actions. Um, so if there's a perception of Iran as a threat in the world, it's something we should seriously be worried about. It's not like, okay, we just say that you no, know, we are not a threat and then we will be you know, happy with the fact that we believe we are not a threat. That's not enough. We should actually you know, try to change the picture in um, um, any, any possible manner. Uh, so I think that was one of the reasons. I don't know how much it's changed yet because of the predominance of you know, Western media. Of course, it's not easy for Iranian public diplomacy to to flourish or to be influential enough uh, in the world, especially since we lost a lot of time for the past three decades. We haven't really done anything important in the field of public diplomacy, unfortunately. Uh, so now we want to just catch up and then, um, um, you, know, you know, rebuild our, our image in the world. I think it takes time. But to a large extent, I can tell you once again, it's, it can also be facil facilitated by the success of negotiations. If the negotiations achieve uh, its goals, then to a large extent I'm sure that, that even Western media will also uh, be on more ease with Iran. And would it uh, continue to make a change in the Iranian identity, the way they see themselves? Yes, I mean, um, as I said, the most important thing is just to to, to, uh, to feel that we can be a constructive actor in the world. Mm -hmm. This is a change of identity, I think. But um, if we don't like the world system, we, you know, we don't really need to, to be in clash with it. We can get involved, and then through involvement, we try to make changes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you. I think that's most illuminating. Um, I, I like your, uh, you know, your analogy with the Congress of Vienna uh, that, uh, you know, that uh, Iran is perceived as a, as a kind of a rad radical destabilizing force, and uh, but now it's, it's also trying to change uh, in how it's perceived, and you know, we, uh, and some of its actions can be construed as more of a status quo power. Um, I was just wondering, and. and and I know this, this is not something that uh, for the near term, but just looking at it uh, you know, at, a, at a higher level, um, you know, would it make sense for Iran to change the regional dynamics through its relations with Israel? Because it seems to me that that's, that's a very much a, the animus there is very much ideologically driven. So if Iran is no longer going to be, or Iran was never, or it's not going to be an uh, ideologically driven power, uh, then you know there is no geographic continuity with Israel. You know Israel is a small country; it doesn't fundamentally threaten Iran. 
Uh, but yet, you know, it's, it's economically quite powerful. It is, it, it is geopolitically uh, quite powerful for its relations with the US. If Iran can somehow have a Nixon go to China type of moment by changing the dynamic of its relationship with Israel, then through that, it could actually then alter the, the dynamic of its relationship with Arab states and force the Arab states to come to the table uh, with it. Um, okay, I agree with most of what you said, but just the last part is a little bit you know, problematic again. But that would mean that he would you know, bring the Arabs to the negotiation table through forcing them by you know, creating a new source of threat. Like as if you're just allowing it's Israel, so you need to, to be afraid of us. Not, not Israel, this is not Israel, but more just mm -hmm. to create a triangular relationship. Whereas now it's, there's not. Well, I, I don't know how to answer this question. I have to tell you that for the past, uh, at least for the past uh, 10, 12 years, I've been, I've been studying Iran-Israel relations. And my whole PhD research was about it. Um, so I can somehow claim to be a specialist of this particular case. Yet, I don't know how to respond to the questions about Iran's relations because this is a very complicated issue. Um, and it's not, I mean, I think no one has, has a ready answer in his pocket for that. Uh, it depends on many different factors. Um, even when I think about the current negotiations between Iran and the West, I think that eventually, at some point, we will, we will reach Israel. You know, because Israel is also connected to the West. Uh, so, in order to um, somehow um, um, have a better relations with the U.S., I don't have a friendship with the U.S. because it's very early and it's unlikely to happen now. But at least to have a better in a relationship or less animosity, less hostility with the U.S. We we had two options: either to go directly to the U.S. or to go through Israel. Uh, and and first to resolve the question with Israel, and then we would be sure that the Jewish lobby in in the Congress would not anymore you know, block the way. But I think it would be impossible for the Islamic Republic to think about it. So we actually chose the first way, which is a harder way. Because now you see that even you know, Barack Obama is very supportive of, 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 of these negotiations, but the Congress is not. And the Congress is dominated by the variety of lobbies, especially the pro-Israel lobby. So the administration in the U.S. has a very hard job to overcome these kind of difficulties. And uh, let's remember that you know, Barack Obama will end his office in two years, and then if we have another you know, president, even if you know, a democratic president, like for example Hillary, you know, Hillary Clinton comes, comes to office, then it will not be as, uh, as positive as, as Barack Obama, because you know, Clinton is also very close to Israel again. So um, it's a difficult issue, I think, m mostly um, considering domestic structure of U.S. foreign policy, uh, the fact that Israel has a lot of influence. Uh, it, it's, uh, I think at some point it would uh, derail the whole thing. Up to this moment, the U.S. administration has been able to resist the pressure of the Jewish lobby and uh, to continue with the negotiations. But um, we don't know what really happens. Because to me, it's not possible. What, what you suggest, it's, you know, it's far, from and far from reality that we can uh, uh, you know, rethink our relations with Israel because that is a very, very hard question. Um, and um, let me just tell you very shortly that that the only reason for us to be opposed to Israel is not ideological. There are other sets of reasons as well. So everybody thinks that the only reason we are opposed to Israel is just because of Islam or the Islamic Republic. It's, it's actually not true. There are three sets of reasons I can summarize to you. Uh, one, one would be ideological, yes. Maybe from the Islamic perspective, Palestine belongs to the Palestinians and it should be, should be released. That is one Islamic principle, okay? But that's not the only thing. I think the 
The other reasons are actually more important. For example, the humanitarian reason that's, that Iranians always, uh, as I said, we actually feel a mission. You know, they feel we have a mission to fulfill. And justice is part of the mission. And I think you know, even a secular state, a secular government in Tehran would be highly critical of Israel because of its uh, you know, violation of human rights and its um, um, unhumane you know, treatment of the Palestinians. It's not easy to say, okay, now we just have a secular state in Tehran, let's, let's be friends with Israel. It's, I can guarantee you that that will not happen because, because Iranians are somehow you know, obsessed with, with the question of justice. Even the Shah was actually turning very critical of Israel in the last decade of his reign. See? Um, and the third reason is actually strategic, that, that, that we consider Israel as a, uh, as a sort of you know, Western offspring in the region, sort of, um, sort of representative of Western domination, symbolically speaking. You see? It's not just a state, but it's actually a symbol of Western domination. It's a sort of um, non-indigenous uh, you know, entity which is not linked to its surrounding in any way. And even the Israelis don't really want to be uh, uh, somehow, I would say, indigenized. Because they actually, they are happy to say that they are somehow higher than these backward Arabs and the Middle Eastern, they are somehow Western, okay? and they represent Western civilization. So they don't even you know, try to become more uh, uh, connected to their surrounding. Uh, so for that reason, I think it's not, it's not really easy. It's not really easy. And what happened between Iran and, and Israel before the revolution, I think that was a very uh, particular case under the Cold War. And it would not necessarily continue, even if the even if the Islamic Revolution did not happen, the, that level of you know friendship between Iran and Israel would not necessarily continue. That's my point. Okay, so 
there, there is some blame to be placed on the you know uh, Iran's attempt to export the revolution. But then that attempt to export the revolution is to be blamed on the fact that we have a revolution. But the revolution itself is to be blamed on the policies of uh, of the Shah, of the US and yeah. foreign, as well as uh, the West. So you know that is endless. Mm -hmm. But for me the main issue is does your analysis uh, is what you're saying. If we were to introduce these other factors, that contradict what you are saying. Mm -hmm. In other words, if we were to introduce uh, the factors relating to Iran as a main or a role, such as export of the revolution, does that invalidate what you are saying uh, now? Mm -hmm. I don't think it does. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, really, you know, omitting certain you know, factors or facts in your discussion doesn't mean that it invalidates what you are saying. Too much of the discourse is on Iran's blame or the bringing this course away from that. But to be honest with you, maybe it's hard for you to believe, but as a person coming from Iran, I don't really think that the idea of export of a revolution was a serious thing from the beginning. It was just a war of rhetoric, in many ways. And, uh, sorry? It was not a very serious issue, as you can imagine, outside of Iran, that's why Iran wanted to conquer the whole region. I don't really think it was a serious, serious issue. It was just a sort of, uh, in a rhetoric, naturally coming out of, out of the revolution. And I think in most revolutions, you have this concept of export of revolution, you know, because you think you've done a great thing, you want, you want others to follow you as well. But it doesn't really mean that, I mean, yeah, I mean, there was a sort of establishment in Iran called the, uh, the organization for support of uh, freedom seeking movements and so on and so forth. Uh, through which Iran gave money to some of these uh, uh, you know, freedom seeking movements here and there. But I don't think that was a serious issue. At that time, we were, we were really preoccupied with war. I think war with Iraq was the first priority of Iran during the 80s. Okay? So anything just would come after that would be just a secondary issue, to be honest. At the time when our own survival was in danger, we were not really in a, you know, in a position to talk about conquering the region. You know, it's, it's not possible. Uh, there were some kind of fractions, radical fractions in Iran, which, which did so, which did support these, these kind of actions. But at the end of the day, I think the mainstream was not really supportive of that. For example, you know, Ayatollah Khamenei, you know, at the time Mr. Rafsanjani was the speaker of the parliament, and even Ayatollah Khamenei himself, at the end of the day, they did not give much credit to those people who wanted to do such actions of, you know, beyond the borders of Iran. Um, and let me just remind you, when, when Israel attacked Lebanon in 1982, that was just, you know, the beginning of Hezbollah. You know, the whole story about this one. The Revolutionary Guards uh, sent almost a thousand officers to Lebanon to actually fight over there. And um, their commander was called Ahmad Mutagasserian. And they went there um, upon the initiative of Minomo Senri Zayi, who was the commander in chief of the guards, in order to fight this thing with the Israelis. And as soon as Ayatollah Khomeini was informed about it, he he was so angry, and he ordered for the immediate retreat of those forces from Lebanon. He said, um, we have no plan to go to war with Israel. Our first priority is the war with Iraq. And the whole group actually returned, except Ahmad Mutabas Sadiyan, who was actually ambushed. And then now, you know, we don't know if he, he, was, um, he was killed or, you know, he was alive or something. But, but since then, you know, nobody knows where he is. Um, but the rest of the group actually returned. So, Ayatollah Khomeini made it very clear from the beginning we have no intention, no plan to go to war with Israel. Uh, and at that part, and that was Israel, okay? Israel, which, which you can, of course, justify uh, war with Israel on the basis of ideological reasons very easily. But he did not even approve that, let alone going to war with Arab countries, you know, you know, over the purpose of export of revolution kind of thing. 
that was just a sort of rhetoric, I think, that was not really too serious, as it seems in the West. Um, and yeah, so I think that's what we want. I have some very <coughs> mixed questions. My first one was to continue with your thinker. He's a very business. He's really grabbing somebody else's land. That's all that there is to it. And it had the support of the Western powers. But even in America today, there's a group of uh, Jewish people who are against this sort of thing. And slowly, it might, it might turn if the conditions in the Arab world change. It's very funny, isn't it, that the Arabs are not helping the Palestinians? They're their own people. So what's wrong? Number two, sir, is women. The rights of women in Iran. I have seen and uh, admired them in their standing up to a lot of things. But recently, there's been the case of hanging this child bride that's gone around the world, a 14 year old married. Uh, there's something needs to be done to Islamic laws that prohibit such marriages at that age. Uh, we die here in Singapore. So there is a marriageable age. And I think. Many times marriages? So. You mean fish man marriage? No, no. Marriage. The age groups. You know, as soon as you reach puberty, you can get married. All this nonsense has to stop. And I think uh, uh, this uh, also is to other countries. But I, I did hear that the clergy, some clergy in Iran have supported this. And I have, of course, any sensible person who has a daughter or a granddaughter in my case, yeah. would object to this nonsense. Mm -hmm. That this is a, a change of our own faith. And it's about time to realize that because the Quran says men and women are equal. So that's one thing. The other is the change of power politics in the in, in the Middle East. The Americans now have their oil. So they're not dependent, which is why there is much less interest in what's happening in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. Third is a revolution amongst the Arabic countries. Now this affects Iran, because Iran is right in the middle of it, whether it likes it or not, it's there. Uh, what would Iran's policy be? If the Arabs tomorrow say, let's get rid of all our sultans and all our kings, out they go, you know. Or they're replaced by current people who have just brought me up. Caliphate. ISIS. <laughs> ISIS and, and these sort of crazy things done in the name of Islam. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. So it's just that we're very, we have to that. close the discussion, the session, so you can just so give your final remarks. Can I, can and I maybe speak after. Just end this? Yes. Can I just end this there? That, uh, Iran has a role to be part of this time. Uh, it was a okay, tremendous time for Iran to expand. I wish he had been allowed to stand again. Mm -hmm. It would have been I don't know what to think about this. Uh, incidentally, I'm, I brought in the first delegation from Singapore to Iran after the, after the war, after the Saddam War. So I know something about what I'm talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think you, um, well, this was one one question to me that was about the marriage age, which is not relevant to foreign policy, although since I've also studied law a little bit, I can, I can respond to that uh, if you think it's relevant, otherwise not. Uh, anyways, I think there is a sort of ambiguity in Iranian law about the sort of differentiation between um, um, as we said, you know, puberty and the age of, as we call it, um, the age of growth, um, the age of growth, that means legal growth. Um, before there was there was a difference. Okay, 
from the religious perspective, maybe girls have like religious duties to do since the age of nine, or the boys you know, since the age of you know, 14, 15. But um, with the perspective, from, the, from the perspective of legal, you know, legal responsibilities, then I think the age of 18, or in some countries 21, would be uh, more common to adopt. And that existed in our law uh, you know, at the beginning of the revolution. At some point, I don't know when exactly, but it was some, some years after the revolution that they were uh, just you know, mixed up again. Uh, and I agree with you, this is one of the shortcomings of the current law, but it's very easy to go back to the previous law. It's, it has nothing to do with uh, Sharia or something. This is, if the parliament decides on the Guardian Council or the you know, Experience Council approves, it will happen. And uh, so, it, it, you know, it's not a dramatic case. I think all lawyers accept that this is a problem. Because if you would allow, you know, a girl to get married at that age, you, you should also allow her to drive at the same age. Or um, to actually, you know, claim other responsibilities that other adults have. Is it possible? No. So, yes, I think I agree with you that that's a problem, but it's not a big problem. I'm, I think many people in Iran know, you know, know about it. Okay, thank you very much for your comments. I already have to close.